Uh, this is a very intimidating audience for me. Um, if you have any questions on methodologies, ask Michelle. And uh, our brilliant phylogenetic analyst is Jonathan Davies, who's um, done a huge amount for um, making these things happen. So my job here uh, is to talk to you a little bit about savannas, which is the system within which you are living in Kruger National Park. So here are five things you need to know about savannas. Um, they see four grassy systems. What C4? C4 is a photosynthetic pathway, and the most important feature of it is it operates very well under low carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. As CO2 increases, C4 plants will be increasingly threatened. And savannas have varying tree cover. They're very extensive in the tropics and subtropics. They don't have a distinct climate signal. So uh, they occur in climates that can also support completely different vegetation. They're often in seasonal climates with wet, dry cycles. The wet cycle builds lots of grass fuel, biomass, and the dry allows fires to burn. So savannas account for the largest burnt areas per annum in the world. They also support the largest remaining remnants of Pleistocene megafauna. And here you have the opportunity to see them. So there's a map, and uh, if you look, the uh, I don't bother up here. That's rather boring. Uh, parts of the world, but if you look down in the south here, it's uh, really interesting. And those are the, the lighter brown are the grassy parts of the world. You see lots in Africa and Australia and South America. If you look at Africa, Africa is the grassiest of all the continents with lots of yellowy brown. There's the, the evergreen forests, and these lighter green are more densely wooded savannas. If you uh, look at the kinds of grasses that grow, this bright red indicates C4 grasses, these grasses that are designed to cope with very low CO2. The Northern Hemisphere, uh, Eurasia, is our C3 grasses. The US has both types. Um, and South America, we have a patch of savanna there. And the northern parts of Australia have these C4 grassy savannas. They vary tremendously in tree cover. This is not a dry area. This is the wettest part of South Africa and it's basically treeless, but it's still C4 grassy uh, system. So for this talk, I'm gonna call this savanna, but we also call them grasslands. And at the other end, we get something like this, which some people call forest. It's not a forest because the understory consists of a continuous layer of C4 grasses. C4 grasses are very intolerant of shade. So when you see a C4 grass understory, it tells you that there's lots of light coming through the canopy and uh, it supports, and, and how on, what on earth is that doing? Well, uh, with lots of light coming through the canopy, um, the trees must be tolerant of whatever process produces a high light understory, and that process is typically fire. So this is a non-savanna, this is a forest where there's enough shade to shade out the C4 grasses underneath. Completely different species composition of the trees, different functional attributes. And uh, so the distinguishing feature of a savanna is if you look underneath, the C4 grasses. Well, we all know that climate determines world vegetation, but does it? You know, it's a hypothesis, and we shouldn't get too blind by old hypotheses. We should give them a kick every now and again. And um, the trouble in Africa is you find scenes like this again and again and again, where in the same climate, you have utterly different vegetation types with utterly different plants and animals growing here and insects compared to in the forest over there. And you find this all over the tropics. This is in Gabon, this uh, mosaic of forests and savannas. Uh, it's very surprising. And when you look down at something like this, you say, well, the poor forest, it's all been deforested. In this case, it's actually completely wrong. We know what went on here. The grasslands are ancient, the forests are new. But the general idea over the last 200 years is that savannas are anthropogenic and the result of deforestation. Trees have been chopped down here, creating these open habitats. And they've either been chopped down or they've been burnt out by human fires. So fires are very influential. And these fires lit by humans have destroyed the forest, rolled them back, and produced these grassy degraded systems. Oh, 
The other process that people uh, worry about um, is domestic livestock, animals. You look at these goats here, just look what they've done. They've eaten up all the small plants here, the woody plants, and only the tall things are left. So rolling back forests through the action of browsing um, and creating these degraded grassy systems to replace them. So from this perspective, savannas are degraded forests. They are horrible degraded lands and they need to be restored. And the policy implications come up in something like the Bond Challenge, which is a plan to plant forests and to turn fire off and to discourage animals, livestock farming in all the world's grassy, grassy areas. Uh, mustn't do this. And it's supported by the IUCN, the German government. Many other governments are buying into it, probably yours. The science is supported by the World Resource Institute of Washington. And the goal is to reforest one and a half million square kilometers of these degraded forests worldwide within the next four years. Get a target and you can achieve uh, success rapidly. Three and a half million square kilometers by 2030. Let's restore all these degraded lands. Funding international donors. In the COP meeting in Paris, $30 million was uh, pledged for this purpose to 10 African countries who signed on to do this uh, reforestation. The incentive, of course, from the uh, industrial countries is carbon sequestration, which is supposed to reduce global warming uh, based on very shoddy science. And uh, of course, from our point of view, this is funding from the rich countries, which is very welcome. Um, and then there's real areas of uh, serious deforestation, particularly in South America. And this is a major contribution to reforesting those areas. But you can't be, uh, can't help being a bit cynical. There are also foresters out there who are looking to expand the forestry industry and uh, to gain some cash from timber products. So what is the map? Where are they going to do this? Well, here's a map. These orange colors here indicate um, forest restoration opportunities, all the orangey and yellow bits. The key bit here for Africa is that the orange bits are grassy biomes. What we mapped was grassy biomes. What you would have seen in that satellite image that I showed you for Africa. So the forest restoration opportunities exactly overlie our savannas. And this is uh, following this assumption that uh, savannas are degraded forests. There is an alternative hypothesis, which these people should have understood and read about, but they haven't, that savannas are actually ancient, that the climate misfit is ancient. The presence of a grassland in a climate that's warm enough and wet enough to support forests is not new and anthropogenic, but could be ancient. And savannas exist because of consumer control, where the two consumers are large vertebrate herbivores and another one which is very similar to herbivory, which is fire. And that both of these are also ancient. So the two creators of savannas in this image from the Serengeti are the large mammals and the fire, two different classes of consumers. How do you test the antiquity of savannas? And to indicate that uh, maybe you should take a deep breath before you say we're going to convert one and a half million square kilometers, which is equivalent to the land area of South Africa, by the way. Um, so how old are savannas? And the, the way in which we trace that was um, looking for fossils. And in those fossils, looking for uh, carbon isotopic composition. And it turns out that the C4 grasses that characterize savannas have a completely distinct <coughs> isotope signal which is quite different from the uh, ancestral C3 type. So this is the isotopic composition. It's a ratio of uh, delta 13 C to delta to uh, carbon 13 to carbon 12. Don't have to worry about that, but this is the ancestral type. This is um, an age axis from 15 million years to zero million years. And what you see, starting with Pakistan, this is a paleosol. And what's happened in the paleosol is that the carbon produced by plants has been stored as fossil carbon. And it's all C3. And then suddenly, whoops, as an act of creation, bam, C4 grasses take over the world. Incredible. Absolutely remarkable. And look at that. That's East Africa, completely different continent. And the timing. And the speed of trans transformation is, uh, is the same. 
absolutely extraordinary. North America, more, um, not as close to the tropics, and we get the transition, but it's slower. So it doesn't happen everywhere at exactly the same point, but the beginnings all seem to date to around seven or eight million years ago. So uh, Serling, who, who first pulled all the evidence together, said, look, this appearance of C4 grassy biomes is unprecedented in Earth's history. It's unique. There's nothing like it. There's nothing as abrupt and as widespread. Something like 20% of the Earth's vegetated land surface is covered with savannas, and they didn't exist before eight million years ago. Um, bam! Suddenly the whole world gets covered with them. What on Earth was going on? So what drove the grass revolution? The short answer is, we don't know. <laughs> what a thrill. If you're a scientist looking for something new, anyway, let me pretend that we, we do know. Well, we have certainly learned something. Um, and you could ask, are these savanna origins, these abrupt origins driven by increased fire activity? That's really important today. Was there no fire and then suddenly fire took off and the uh, savannas carved holes into the forest, rolling them back. Perhaps it was increased herbivore pressure so that the herbivores changed and began rolling the forest back and replacing it with uh, savannas. So how do you look in the fossil record for fire and herbivore impacts? It's not so easy. Um, this is just a, an indication of the distribution of fossils fossil sites. Each of these blue dots indicates a major site that's been used to interpret the past for savannas. The thing that struck me was how few there are, how incredibly sparse fossil sites are, and yet how influential the stories are from each of those tiny little sites. The second thing that I noticed was um, how few of them were actually located in savannas of today. Here's South America and all these fossil sites are neatly located where there aren't any savannas. In Africa, there's one site there, and then there are the East African sites on Olduvai Gorge, which is an arid savanna, and the rest are sitting in the deserts and so on. In Australia, there are none at all in the savannas. So, you know, the, the fossil sampling is quite thin. So this is a clear case to try and use dated molecular phylogenies to interpret Earth's history. And those phylogenies um, the first person to do this was Marcella Simon uh, in uh, South America. It's very fuzzy reading here. Sorry, I can't even read it from up here. But um, they looked at the DNA molecular phylogenies in Brazil, where there are no fossils in these fire-dependent savannas. Um, and dated molecular phylogenies showed very nicely that the uh, savannas had emerged from forests and were fire adapted, and they gave a date of those fire ad ad adaptations. We were inspired by this work. We didn't have the same um, molecular, um, the same density of sampling, but we wanted to know what was going on in Africa. So how old are the fire dependent savannas in Africa? There's no terrestrial record of charcoal in Africa. Um, and it's basically because wherever you have a lot of fire, there's a lot of rain, the soils are deeply weathered and fossils don't accumulate. So the fossils are highly biased towards the most arid savannas. Uh, there's some marine records of charcoal fluxes, but the phylogenies um, give us a way of trying to estimate dates of the past. So we put together this paper, Savanna Fires and the Origins of the Underground Forests of Africa. Um, underground forests. That's amazing. Well, it comes from a classic paper by Frank White. Uh, we took the term from him, and it's in this famous, highly cited, high impact factor journal called the Singapore Garden Bulletin. Um, wonderful paper. And the underground trees which make the forests are dwarf trees. They have closely related sister species that are tall trees. They're restricted to frequently burnt savannas. So they're a marker. We can use them as a, as a key marker of a savanna that requires fire to maintain it. And they also occur in harsh growing conditions. So this was our indicator of when frequently burnt savannas evolved. 
So we used a phylogeny based on barcoding uh, DNA to date the divergence of underground trees from their taller tree cystitaxa. This is what these things look like. This is Gardenia and the Riviere. See, that's a normal tree, and that's an underground tree. So you imagine the stem of the tree, just pull it down, uh, pull it down uh, until just the tips of the leaves are sticking ab above the soil, and you get something that looks like that. This is another s family, Proteaceae. It's very diverse phylogenetically. This has happened in numerous independent clades. This is uh, Araliaceae, Carsonia, and that's what they normally look like. In fact, that's the only way I know them. Grab hold of that trunk, yank it down until just the tip is remaining and you have an underground tree. This is what they look like in nature. Uh, I hate this thing, anyway. And there, this is in Brazil, and there's the canopy of this single uh, underground tree. And if you look around it, that's typical Cerrado with these little dwarf trees, hopeless things, struggling to grow tall. They get consumed by fires regularly. They're slow growing, so their chances of making a tall tree are very low. And under these circumstances, there's selection for these underground trees, which produce lots of fruit and flowers, but you have to do it at ground level. That's what they look like below ground, we think. Uh, some of them have been dated to 3,800 years old. So if you see one of these things, you bow down, you know. Uh, these are honorable and ancient uh, creatures, at least as old as many oaks of Europe. Um, these are true ancient old growth grasslands, not forests, and do them honor. But you first got to identify them and recognize them. This is where they grow, typically rather nutrient poor soils, uh, open, always open habitats, never in forests, and they're always in high rainfall areas that are frequently burnt. Often in seasonally waterlogged sites like this, in South Africa, some of them occur where we have uh, periodic frosts, um, all of which creates poor growing conditions, so it's difficult to grow into a tree in the presence of frequent fires. And uh, the, uh, the underground tree is a, is a convergent response. So um, using Jonathan's brilliance, we created these phylogenies from uh, Michelle and her group's uh, DNA barcoding. And the wonderful thing is if you need more species to bulk it up, depending on your question, you can go out and do it. And uh, from this, we were able to start dating the origin of fire-dependent savannas by looking at the appropriate growth form. And here are the results. Um, this is the first African study which was able to date the origin of fire-dependent savannas. Starting, we're not quite sure about these, it could be incomplete sampling, but from about five to six million years onwards, with uh, a very young peak at two million years. This is a brand new biome, one of the world's newest biomes, uh, but much older than human deforestation. Can you validate these things? Well, when you get fires, you can see all this smutty stuff. That's not uh, fungus on the slide. It's actually charcoal blowing up in the wind, and it drifts across, gets dumped in the ocean, and ocean drilling programs can pick up the charcoal flux. This is a charcoal flux from 10 million years ago, and these are the same sites one million years ago. Just look at those changes, orders of magnitude change in uh, the charcoal flux representing a huge increase in global biomass burning. So here's um, what we get with this massive surge of fire activity starting, say, four million years ago. And this is the, um, that database showing charcoal flux in the tropics, and uh, that's five million years ago, and look at that. So this seems to track pretty closely the spread of savannas. Um, What's extraordinary, though, is if you look further back in time, there's very little fire activity in the Cenozoic. These are in different latitudes. And all of them, from uh, within the last 10 million years, have shown this enormous increase in fire activity. Before you ask me, we don't know why. I've got some ideas, but others, unfortunately, don't believe me. What about these? What about mammals as creators of savannas? 
not all savannas burn, and uh, lots of uh, mammals go and graze heavily, and um, they also create savannas and maintain savannas. They graze the grasses very heavily, they browse the trees very heavily, and uh, these grasses end up with too little fuel. There's just simply not enough grass fuel to burn. So these are mammal savannas. And how old are these? How old are the mammal-dependent savannas? Um, there's a good fossil record of mammals. There are nice bones around. Um, we can infer the diet from carbon isotopes. We can look at the dentine of teeth and, and say with a C3 or C4 grasses. You can look at the scratch marks on the teeth. What you can't tell is whether there was enough browsing pressure to drive back forests. For that, we need some marker among the plants again. So we use the same sort of logic as we had used for trying to explore the uh, fire origins of uh, savannas. So what's the marker? Well, the marker of really high mammal activity is all around you in Kruger. Just go for a nice walk and swing from the trees and see what happens. Or even better, try and put your face in to one of our trees and see how many leaves you can bite off. It's a very good measure of uh, the degree of physical defense against um, feeding by this creature, the impala, and its uh, relatives, the antelope of Africa. These spiny plants are extremely rare or absent from a forest understory. The shade is uh, incompatible with spines as a physical defense. So this is a good marker of when you have an open habitat, in other words, a savanna type plant growing instead of one in the shade of a forest. They come in diverse forms and shapes, wonderful actually, uh, celebrate them. And um, what we did was to look at the sample of just ne nearly 2,000 species, again through uh, Michelle and her group's DNA barcoding sampling. And we could look at the distributions of all these species, and from those, look at layers uh, of different habitat variables and environmental variables to pick up the markers of high spinescence. So this end is high, lots of spiny plants, and this end is low spiny plants. And we were able to link it with the particular classes of herbivores, and the best predictors of spiny plants are large browsers and um, medium-sized mixed feeders, of which the impala, which you will have seen in the reserve in Kruger, is uh, the quintessential example. They never are associated with these guys, which is small antelope living in deep forest. In terms of the abiotic environment, they occur where there's high nutrient soils. Uh, they're pretty neutral with respect to fire and climate. But uh, in rainfall, they never occur where there's high rainfall. They're always at the drier end of the rainfall gradient. Uh, that's where you find spiny plants in Africa. In terms of vegetation, mixed savanna is where you get most of them and you never find any in these evergreen forests. So quite clear environmental indicators allowing us to reconstruct um, the past if the past is analogous to the present. So, spiny trees, they're most common with medium-sized grazers and browsers. Um, and those browsers all belong, the antelope belong to a group called the bovids. They're in savannas and more open habitat things, not in forests. They're in drier regions on fertile soils. So we would predict that they could have evolved in response to some new intense browsing pressure from antelope. For example, something happened with the bovid line. And if the bovid suddenly moved in, then we might get a surge of spiny plants. Those bovids nibbling things would have hammered forest trees, which would have had unprotected babies. So out with Jonathan again to create these uh, magnificent uh, DNA barcoded phylogenies using as many species as we could get. The alternative approach would be to use a single lineage. We use many lineages to try and trace what is going on. And uh, the first thing we were interested in was the phylogeny of the bovids. That wasn't our work. We had an existing phylogeny very well calibrated against numerous uh, mammal fossils. So here's time on this axis. 
and here's lineage diversification on this axis. And this is what happens with um, the bovids. They only got to Africa rather late, and then they just rocketed. Uh, absolute surge of speciation. This is the uh, diversification of lineages of non-spiny plants through time, from the early uh, beginnings of the angiosperms. Um, and then now the really interesting thing is we, well, what happens with the spiny plants? Do they follow the same trajectory? Well, no. Look at that. Whoops. <laughs> One day I'll learn how to do the animation myself. Anyway, that is <laughs> this is absolutely incredible. The, I thought that spines would be a general mammal defense. Turns out that they're not. They actually are strongly associated with bovids. They don't work with other mammals. Um, they work quite well for me if I stick my face in to a plant, um, but they don't work as a general rule. So what on earth's gone on here? Africa was an isolated continent, and on this continent, uh, two distinct herbivore groups evolved. The uh, hyracoids in the Afrotheria, this is what they look like today, like guinea pig sort of creatures. This is um, the uh, more elegant <laughs> creatures of the past, going up to uh, over a thousand kilograms. To me, they're just giant versions of these guys. Uh, extraordinary. We don't have no idea why spines don't work as a defense for them. And then the other major group were the proboscideans, the elephants. And we know that um, spines don't work for elephants. The moment that's in your stomach, spines don't work. And the elephants use their trunks to, to, uh, to ingest the spines. So Africa was this island. Um, then it drifted, bumped into Eurasia. And the, ant the bovids all crossed over on that land bridge. And they did so around 16 million years ago. And within less than a million years, spiny plants had begun to evolve. And then you got this apparent coevolution between these groups. And here they are today, uh, major browsers, major browsers. So we think that what went on here, we suggest that the bovids, with a new style of feeding, exerted massive heavy browse pressure on juvenile woody plants and that uh, spines evolved as an effective defense. But only in sunlit habitats, you needed sunlight to produce spines. So the bovids moving into forests were able to roll back the forest by preventing regeneration. So the mammals were indeed uh, involved in the evolution of savannas. This is how we see it now. Uh, here's our background CO2, which is declining over time. Temperatures declining. There's a C4 grass with this rocketing off in Africa. There it fits nicely with the charcoal. That fits nicely with the underground trees. And then we have these semi-arid savannas, of which Kruger is an example, which apparently began much earlier than the C4 grass radiation. So they would have had C3 grasses instead. And... Uh, they were triggered by the arrival of bovids from Eurasia when Africa bumped into uh, Eurasia and the animals were able to cross the islands. The elephants, of course, went in the other direction and uh, went all over the world, creating mammoths, mastodons, gomphotheres, and the like. So to summarize, Africa's grasslands and savannas are not at equilibrium with climate. It's the biggest anomaly for a climate-centric view of the world. Savannas are adapted to heavy consumption by fire and by large herbivores. And both those ecological processes, those consumers, are ancient. They're old. They go back millions of years. If you remove them, if you suppress fires, if you remove the herbivores, you lose the savannas. You have, it threatens the future of savannas. So uh, poor policy, which sees fire as a damaging thing, is... is is going to threaten savannas. These C4 grassy biomes, the savannas, predate our species by thousands and thousands of years, if not millions of years. And uh, they predate anthropogenic deforestation by vast aeons of time. 
it remains that savannas are remarkably young and their origin and, and beginnings are apt to be fascinating. But anything that assumes that these things are anthropogenic really is wrong. So these forest restoration projects proposed by the Bond Challenge are wrongly targeting ancient ecosystems. And by saying we're going to target, we're going to reforest one and a half million square kilometers in the next four years, there's massive risks of really dumb consequences of trashing our savannas. I'll leave it at there. Thanks very much. Yeah, the um, human evolution, the hominid evolution uh, overlaps almost exactly with that seven million year period. Um, of course, the savannas were evolving at the same period as other continents with no hominids. So uh, it would seem as though the evolution was, there is a hypothesis that hominid evolution is linked to the development of savannas. Um, but I don't, and then we, we're not sure about the causes. We're not sure the degree to which hominids or our own species uh, helped to drive further expansion. Uh, it's an open question. If it did happen, the, the current best guess it happened within the last uh, couple of millennia. You're not allowed to ask methodological questions, Yalis. <laughs> no, no, I, I will certainly not. The, um, the only thing, like your point of view, on the other hand, we talked about this already, is the uniqueness of African savannas. I mean, nowadays, you know, the South American Cerrados, Southern, Southern India savannas, um, Australia, they don't have mega herbivores. So how, how, do you f how do you see the uniqueness of the actual savanna systems we have here? Do you really think that it's specific to immigrations of bovids in the Miocene? Is it specific to the actual C4 lineages we have here in Africa? Or is it just, I don't know, um, a contextual issue? Yeah, no, thanks. The, so the fire story, uh, our dates of radiation of the fire dependent growth forms in Africa coincides to one decimal point with the South American uh, work of Marcella Simon. So that looks as though it's a global signal causing fires to switch on. The mammal uh, impact, we would say, is specific to Africa and precedes the C4 grass radiation. So we think it was a C3 grass. And that requires testing. And the prediction would be that uh, savannas are older, C3 type savannas are older, for example, in Eurasia, where, which was the source of the bovids. So there's lots to be done. Uh, on the mammal side of things, and I think it's a it's a fascinating area. South America, really bizarre. What were the what were the herbivores there? You know, they were all strange things, and yet uh, Argentina, for example, is full of prickly plants, as is the uh, Catinga of Brazil. So, laugh. In interesting uh, stories to be unravelled. Thanks. 